Let's pray. to see some of the same faces from last time. Um, how many people had a good day? How many people had an okay day? How many people didn't have a good day today? Okay. All right. So some of you, many of you didn't raise your hand, so that means, so I don't know what that means, <laughs> actually. Um, so last time, the, the, the focus of the discussion was healthy uh, friendships, healthy courtships. And I think, you know, it felt like there was a lot more conversation that we needed to have or that we wanted to have. So some of it is going to be a continuation and really we're not bound by what I have here. Wherever we want the discussion to go, I want to leave a little bit more space tonight for us to, to talk. I always say that and then I'm like, no, no. So, you know, you can try to catch me on that. I didn't know what to put for the title, but I decided, I decided to call tonight's talk Searching from the Inside Out. And I was just telling someone on the way down, you know, it's so, especially with this series on, you know, dating and courtship and relationships, it's so easy to go towards talking about the other person, um, the, you know, what they should be like, where we can find them, um, just characteristics about the other person. And the last thing we probably want to talk about in this top, like this is the one time that a lot of people don't want to talk about themselves. I don't want to talk about me. I want to figure it out. I want to figure out how I'm going to find the right person. What's the formula? Like what's, what works? Uh, what are the best practices? But really most of tonight, um, I'm going to challenge us to talk about ourselves. Um, and if you remember when I was here two weeks ago, one of the points I made was that and, and, and I, I put the same exact slide in here later on, which is really, I can't, I can't put myself into a healthy relationship unless I am com satisfied in my life on every level. There's always gonna be a deficiency and it's gonna come up um, and, and we'll talk about it when we get there. If I'm looking for a relationship to meet, to satisfy an unmet need, regardless of what the unmet need is, even if it's very legitimate, I'm lonely. That's a very legitimate need. It's very human need, it's a very emotional need. Um, but if the reason that I'm, s I'm searching for relationship, committed relationship with someone is to satisfy that need, then it's not, that's not a good sign. And I know what I'm saying is it's hard and it's not easy, but that's why it requires a lot of work that I need to do on myself. So I can get to a point where I'm not looking for relationship because I'm, I'm missing something but I'm looking for a relationship because I have something to offer. And it's a, it's a really big difference and it takes a lot, a lot of time to get there. Um, and most of us get married and we're not there, you know, to be quite honest. Like, I'm not gonna stand here and say we're, everyone who gets married is because they, they're completely satisfied with themselves, not at all. But the more I can become <coughs> satisfied with myself, the more that I can be content with the different areas of my life, spiritually, socially, intellectually, um, physically, the more I can be content with that, the less I have to bring that into my marriage <coughs> as an issue to be dealt with, okay? And, and you know, we could think of so many different examples. Um, if someone gets into a relationship because they are, more than any other reason, lonely, at, at what point is that gonna fade away? And then what, what does that marriage look like, you know, three months, six months, or a year down the road? 
we're going to talk about that. I'm going to give you guys a chance to discuss it. But that's my sort of intro to tonight's. That's why tonight we're going to search from the inside out. Um, before I actually go to the next slide, <laughs> I'm going to challenge us tonight to do something that we don't typically do, which is to be willing to trust one another and be a little bit vulnerable. You remember last time I spoke, one of the key things I was saying when I was, um, one of the points we discussed was, why not consider if you have a good friend and this good friend has all these you know, great qualities and characteristics, including someone that you can trust, they're loyal to you, you know they have your back, you know they'll be honest even when it's hard. And one of the other things we said was um, someone who you can be vulnerable or you could be really yourself in front of them and it's okay. Um, and I was saying that those friendships, some of them might be worth exploring further. So tonight, I'm not saying that you guys have to come out of here as best friends, but I want you to trust each other to the, and feel safe to the extent that you're able. And that, that might look different for each person, but we are gonna do a little turning and talking. And as much as you're willing to be honest with yourself and with the person you're talking to, as much as I think you'll get out of uh, tonight. So, someone could read this, uh, this scripture. This is gonna kind of be the heart of where we where we spring off tonight. It's the measure of character. Because last time we spoke, we said, you may be attracted to someone's physique, but you're gonna live your life with their character. What you're living with is a person's character. So, Mike? Uh, we also worry tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, character hope. Okay. So the Bible talks about character. Another word for character is who you are. I'm not going to use the definitions from last time. My character is who I am. That's my character. Okay? And the scripture is clear. It says that tribulation produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character hope. Um, can someone give... I'll just give an example to get us moving. A tribulation, for example, could be um, I have a parent who is, you know, suffering with cancer or some kind of, you know, uh, very difficult illness. And through that, I'm persevering in my life to care for that person. I'm persevering in my life to pray for that person. I'm persevering in my life to, um, to really just keep my faith and keep my friendships and, and totally not lose hope. So that perseverance becomes part of my character. If I don't persevere or I give up or I lose hope in God, that, that is part of my character as well. We know that a person's true character obviously shines forth when? In the good times or in the hard times? In the hard times, right? And that's why uh, when Abuna and I were, were see, you know, we were recording and getting to know each other, I actually remember one time we went and sat with Abuna Antonios and I, I don't remember the whole conversation, but he said so, he asked us something like, what do you guys argue about? And Abuna's like, oh. And Abuna wasn't Abuna. He was Mike at the time, Michael. And he's like, oh, we don't argue. He's like, we haven't had a fight. And it was true. Up until that point, we hadn't had a fight. And Abuna Tunis goes, Eda, go, go fight. <laughs> go fight and come back to me. I think he wanted to see what the true perseverance and what the true character of the relationship was. Like when everything was so so sweet, you know, what was the true measure of the character? So, so this scripture tells us that to know a person's character, we really need to see them in, in, in a difficult time, in a stressful time, in a trying time. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna share an, a personal example. Um, so that, cause I'm gonna ask you to do this in a minute. So I want you to see what I'm talking about. So one of the things we're going to do tonight is we're going to look back. We're going to look back in our life to our family of origin and to basically our, mo most importantly, our parents and any immediate siblings that we have. And we're going to think about, like, what was life like for me growing up um, in my family of origin? And what were the influences that shaped my character? So here's, an, and, and specifically, not just the experiences, but what were the hardships? Because we could talk about the good times, and we could talk about the positives, and, and there's lots of those. I don't want to ignore them. But it's really what were the challenges 
that shaped who I am. Because I'm a particular way for a reason. You're a particular way for a reason. It's not accidental. So for me, um, money was always an issue. Always. As, from the day I think I, I could remember, my dad always worked like 10 to 12 hour days. He commuted two hours a day. Um, he was always tired. Money was always tight. If my parents argued, it was about money. Money, 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 money. Money was very central part of my life growing up because it just wasn't there. From the age of 13, I started to work. And I worked every day of my life except for the two years after I had my kids. Because to me, I, needed to, I, I didn't want to rely on anybody. And I never wanted to be in the situation that I saw, excuse me, my parents in. So today, here, now let me, tra let me fast forward and translate what it looks like. Part of my character is I'm very, very um, careful with how I spend money. The value of money to me is different than the value of money to Abuna, for example. Abuna will tip 20%, 25%, and I'll say, what are you doing? We, we tip 15%. That's me. That's me. And it's for a reason. Like, it, again, it's not just accidental. There's a reason. Because the value of money to me is different. I also, from a young age, became like a parent to my parents in the sense that if they were in hardship or they couldn't you know, communicate something effectively, I translated for them. Or um, if I needed to advocate at school because I wanted to be in the honors classes and they didn't want me to be, I was my own advocate. So I was, you know, and, and please, my parents are wonderful people and I'm, I, I'm not speak. my parents, yeah, I mean, they, they couldn't have sacrificed themselves more, but my situation is a real part of who I am. And it's a real part of why I am an advocate. If you guys know me, I'm an advocate. I fight for people, I care about people, I want people to have their rights met because I saw how my parents didn't always have their rights met. So that's an example of a financial hardship. And then one last example of it, up until the last few years of my life, I was a bit of a perfectionist. I was very disorganized, but I was perfectionist. I had standards that were high and sometimes too high to be realistic. And that was part of me trying to always take control. The things I saw around me growing up that I didn't like, I wanted to make them better. I wanted to control them. And in many cases, I was the one that made things better at home. Because I was the one that was educated enough and diligent enough to do so. So when you see Mora and you see her standing here and you talk to her or whatever the case is, you see how I parent my children, all of that is related to where I come from. And we can't, we can't deny our past. And, and before we, I give you a moment to think about this, we also can't say, because this happens, you know, I used to be really far from God, and then I came, and I, I had an experience in my life where I'm a different person. Like the Bible says, I'm a new creation. True, we are a new creation. True, we have put on the mind of Christ. But uh, there's a quote that there was something I was going to tell you later, but I'll tell you now. Jesus is in my heart, but as some would say, Giddo is still in my bones. Right? I don't take away my family of origin. I don't un unpack it. But I, I grow from it and I, I develop character through it. This is, you're saying, what are you talking about tonight? We're talking about dating, we're talking about courtship. How am I going to get married? This has everything to do with it. Because as, more, as I can understand myself and why I am the way I am, the more I, I, I can understand why I'm attracted to certain people or not attracted to certain people and what I have to offer certain people or what I need to work on. So, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take a few minutes and I gave you the example of financial hardship. Uh, there's lots of other examples you can consider and I'm gonna ask you to take a risk and choose something that you feel comfortable, that's safe enough for you to talk about uh, with someone next to you I'm going to call it a tribulation or an earthquake event. An event that is significant enough that you can remember it, that you feel really did shape or does shape your character. Okay? Again, I, I know this is a risk. This is not usually what we do. But um, at le you could be general about it. You don't have to talk in specifics. Okay? So take a minute. Find someone that you feel you can talk to and identify a tribulation or earthquake event in your life that shaped your character. I'm <laughs> 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 
Okay, guys, just take one minute to wrap it up, please. <laughs> okay, guys, let's bring it back, please. You want to keep going, right? It's okay, yeah. Thank you. I've told my family everything I have to say. Okay, guys and girls and ladies and gentlemen, we're going to bring it back to the large group so that we can um, possibly share a little bit if anyone is comfortable and I will I'll share some other examples with you um, does anybody want to share something uh, that you can identify that you remember distinctly in your own family of origin that you feel shaped your character or shapes who you are today you don't have to yeah um, I think with many people here like especially myself um, like Scholastic achievement was always like a very big priority in the home. Uh, and when you didn't achieve that, then you know it was kind of like equivalent to your value. Mm. Or that's how you perceived it to be. Um, so I remember this one time where I did really bad and I'm like the third child, so like my parents kind of I was doing bad in junior high school, my parents got somewhat upset, but then my oldest brother, who was like the first child and really got the one end of like this pressure, realized that I was doing bad and, you know, he made me feel very bad about it. And it really pushed me later on, and it, from then on, uh, it made me want to try hard in my scholastic life, but at the same time, um, it kind of made me equate myself, my value to how well I did, mm. like, academically. Interesting. And then you can also th take that one step further and think about how you may either consciously or unconsciously put value on people who value yeah. ad achievement in academics and people who don't. Yeah, yeah. And that's gonna be really interesting because that directly links into what we're gonna talk about later, which is for you, Amir, maybe you would never consider someone who didn't graduate from college to marry, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, I'm, and I'm not putting a value judgment. I'm not here tonight to, to put the, the, the definition or the checklist in place for you on what are the values you should look for if you're looking to be in a, in a committed relationship. But what I do want to say is um, we really do need to be more open. I don't think we should compromise certain values, but I do think we need to be more open outside of our box, our little box that we have. Um, and surprisingly, the compliment that people can have when they are aware of what they're ruling out and why they might be ruling it out. Um, I was going to say this earlier and I forgot. Let me just comment and then I'll see if anyone wants to share. In um, career counseling, there's like um, one of the big researchers. Her name is Godfordson. Yes. Who said yes? 
Oh, my field. Oh, That's wonderful. Like, Can you? I'm here. <laughs> okay. Would you like to tell us a little bit about her theory about the exclu career exclusion and how that? Basically, done? she was talking about how like the sexes, like what's appropriate for um, boys and girls to uh, you know, like career choices. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, that was the main one. Like, it, whether the job was sex appropriate, that was the major one, and also um, in society, if it was also appropriate as well. And I'm getting nervous. So Godfordson was the, the psychologist who basically identified how um, a lot of uh, females would t assume certain roles, career roles, and not others, and how males would assume certain career roles and not others. And one of the, one of the key premises that I want to tie into this is she found that from a very, very young age, and actually I can attest to this, I'll tell you in, in just a second, boys and girls from very young age already, not even realizing it consciously, excluded certain career choices from their mind. Um, about six months ago, I was taking the kids around to look at some different like preschool programs and the guy put us in a, in a room with you know different toys and things and he says, you know, play. And I think um, Joseph picked up like a firefighter hat and I took a picture, it was so cute, and I was like, oh, let's send it to Bubba, you know? And I was like, come on, Gracie, put on the hat. She says, no. She says, I'm not a boy, I can't be a firefighter. She was two and a half years old. She had already excluded the possibility that she could ever be a firefighter. And so Godfordson talks about like how this happens and how it's conditioned through certain um, social and, and other um, influences. Well, if you translate that into relationships, it's the same, and I, I pick it up from the example, it's the same way. You might not even have realized till I just spoke it, or maybe not, that you would never consider marrying someone if they didn't have a bachelor's degree. For you, it's like maybe a given you never spoke, you never wrote it, but it's like within your character. But where does that come from? What you just said, because to you, achievement in academics is has such a high value that you can't imagine opening yourself to someone. And I, I'm not saying that, but just as an example. But you see how the choices we make are directly affected to our family or of origin and our, our development as in terms of our character. Is there any other example? about a, a significant life event that you feel has shaped the way you are? I, I'll, I'll say something. Um, Thank you. Uh, coming here, I, I, I came from Egypt at nine years old. <coughs> I remember every single family family member having had such a huge family in Egypt. And it, like coming here was like just a shock. Like where they're cut off from everyone, from not having a family, from like, from going to like from 200 people that you can see on a regular basis to just your parents and your brother and that's that and maybe an aunt somewhere. So it, it was just like a really weird situation to, to have to like fit into. Um, so I think that's like what shaped who I am today because like if you, you all know me, I like, I'm always like very friendly. I'm always like trying to like talk to every single person and, and have like a, a like an extended family so to speak. So I think that's one of the main like reasons why I, I, the way I am today has been like shaped by the, like being cut off from a family. Mm. Great, thank but you. you can, but at the same time, you can turn to the opposite side and be shy even around the group and take a, a corner and be isolated. I mean, it can go right. Yeah, it's different and it's way. different it's for different cool. people. The it's same how I did it. Right. It's all it is. Yeah, yeah, the same life circumstance for one person. Can you know, someone in my position whose family struggled with money a lot, now I, I have a career, I have money, maybe I could be spending my money more because, oh, finally, I experience what it's like not to work by a, a checkbook. So it depends on how you take it up in your own character. So based on your, your, your examples, th these ones I'm about to show you might you know, m not be relevant to, to our group, though they may be. Um, here are some examples of major life challenges or earthquake events that that rock our world and shape our character. The, t the key one and the most important one is the first one, and that is an unhealthy parental relationship. If your parents, which honestly, 
Is there a perfect marriage? The only perfect marriage is Christ and the church. That's it. That's the perfect marriage. The, anything else comes uh, on a spectrum. But to whatever degree of uh, health, healthy your parental relationship was is going to influence um, your your development of character. So where where did your parents fall short? Did they fall short in their communication style? Did they fall short in their intimacy uh, with one another in front of you? Did they fall short in negle emotional neglect? Maybe there was a lot of verbal affirmation and a lot of encouragement, but there wasn't a lot of embracing or hugging or showing emotion. That, that's also, that's a very real effect of, of a person's character. Um, again, I, I mentioned har uh, financial hardship or poverty. If there's a premature loss of a parent or a sibling, that can also have a big effect on someone's life and how they shape their character. So if someone lost their mom or their dad prematurely, mm -hmm. prematurely means not from natural causes, um, that can have a significant um, effect as well. Divorce or separation. Um, <coughs> And then if there's like an, a detachment to one of the parents, if there's jealousy towards the parents or f towards the parents or from the parents towards the child, um, a power struggle, incest, which sadly I hear there's th that it occurs way too often in Egypt from what I understand, um, or in some parts of Egypt at least. And these are things we don't talk about and maybe some of you are uncomfortable seeing it on here, but it's the truth um, for, some, for some places. Um, exposure to pornography, family betrayal, like if there's, you know, um, you, you know my, my dad's sister, you know, betrayed the family and now they don't talk to each other. That stuff is real. You can't ignore like, well, that's their stuff. No, that affects our character development because I'm observing how my family dealt with it, how my father dealt with the sister who stopped talking to him or whatever it might be. Do I now have issues with trust or do I have issues with... Um, with, you know, with emotional intimacy or connectedness with people. Um, bullying, I actually sadly have a, ch a student in my school who's uh, a victim of bullying, and I'm trying to understand like what's happening for this kid, and I find out his father actually bullies him at home. So that's a part of his, you know, how he's growing up, how he's developing his own character. He's a ninth grader, he's 14 years old. Um, and then immigration, which kind of, you know, you brought up Kiro. Immigration is a major life event. Uh, to leave your country, to leave your people, to come to a new place at whatever age it is, is a huge life event, changing event. And it does impact our character. Am I, do I feel more, you know, like Dr. Samir said, is it that I feel more drawn to people and I, I need to create that family because I miss it? Or do I feel like so detached because I just can't accept the change? Whatever it is. And, and we can list many other things, but the idea is to understand um, we're shaped our character is shaped by our family of origin and by our life experiences. Um, so, are we okay so far? I know it's, uh, it's you probably thought we were gonna talk about how to find a, a spouse, but we, we're, we're gonna get there. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> this, is a, this, this is very important, the impact of the family, blessing and sins. Obviously, I'm focusing on hardship, but even the blessings, the scripture is powerful, what it tells us. It actually says here, um, maybe someone can read, can read it first out loud. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children, Third and fourth generation. All right, so one of the one of the points that this this passage is talking about is um, even if you look at like the genealogy or the genogram of like Joseph the righteous, and you see the betrayal, it was actually generation after generation. Or if you see, um, I was looking at his genogram earlier, and I have it in one of the books here. It was betrayal, there was some other forms of sin, there were some family breaks, and, and you see them, they didn't just happen like for one generation, but you see them repeated, and, and this is what happens. Like if, if, if I'm in a family where there is, I'll just use myself as an example. So money was a central factor in my family, so I can't imagine that now I'm, I'm, me and Abuna are a new family and we have nothing to do with that, and the way we deal with money has nothing to do with the way I, dealt, I saw money dealt with. No, it's, there, there's an element of 
of that that's going to be passed down for a few generations, three or four is what, is what the scripture says. And I'm using the money, but um, the emotional connectedness and disconnectedness, that's key. Like if we're going to talk about relationship, you can talk all you want about relationship, but if you don't know how to connect with someone emotionally or you don't know how to be intimate with someone or you don't know how to trust someone because you have issues with trust or you have, you, you have issues with forgiving people because you, know, you grew up in a family that you, you held grudges, you always brought up the past. You ever, you ever know families where you know, no matter how many times they told you they forgave you, they always bring up the past? And there's other families that are not like that. Those, that's very different experiences and it does influence us, yeah. But couldn't you look at it, like, just to play devil's advocate, couldn't it be that like I saw, for example, let's just say, I don't know, uh, like a bad relationship between your parents. So I wouldn't want to be like that in my marriage. So it would be the opposite. I would do everything I can to prevent that. So it, it doesn't have to necessarily be that I inherit the kind of relationship they had. It could be that I would do everything I can to prevent what I saw. Like You know what I mean? Right, so what's the difference between a person who mimics that cycle of, you know, behavior and someone who doesn't? What, what, what's the difference? You're right, but obviously there's a difference. Uh, I don't know, honestly. Maybe how severe, like, it, uh, it impacted them, I, I don't know. What do you guys think? Because that, that's key. How do you? I think that's very important because sometimes, <coughs> sometimes we blame the circumstances, the parents, or the way I I, I grow up, in the way I am shaped now, mm -hmm. as if I'm doomed to be like that because my parents were like that. Right. My father has so anger issues. So what exactly, do you expect? So I'm I, so I'm always angry. So right. I mean, yeah. Good. So I'm glad you brought that. So what's what's the shift? What's the difference? Yeah. No, I, I, I just, I was going to say, I think it also depends on how the person perceives that action to be. So the person sees that that the physical abuse between his uh, parents is something bad, he's going to grow up to try to change that. But if he sees it as if that's normal, and it happens in all the families, and he's going to say, well, you know, it's normal, and I, I'm just going to do the same thing. But your perception is determined by the way you're, like, exactly. so your perception is determined by how your parents taught you to, to <coughs> see it. So, like, you could think it's wrong <coughs> if your parents told you it's wrong. It, your perception no, is, when you, you know grow what I mean? older, you have your own morals, your own views but you, on But you still have that bias from your childhood. You can't, you can grow, okay, you can change your mentality of it, but you're still going to have that core bias. Maybe from mm -hmm. school, though. Okay, no, this is good. I, I, I can respond, but I actually think it's important to hear what others say. So, Bishoy and, and then Amir. I mean, if it, obviously you're going to have the bias. That's your question. How do you get past so How do we get past the, my father has anger problems? I'm going to have anger problems. I think for me personally, the first step you have to realize that you have anger problems. Like, sure, he has anger problems, but you might not realize that you yourself have. <coughs> and then the second step is you have to consciously and actively try not to. You can be like, I can just make the decision right now, I am not going to have anger problems. And then if I do nothing about it, it's going to continue. Same thing, you have to consciously and actively try not to be like your parents to have those kind of issues that they didn't, that they did. Thanks. Amir? Yeah, I think even, um, you learn it in school, but you also learn it at church. I think a big, a very big distinguishing factor between me and my two older brothers is the fact that I was, for a very big portion of my life, raised in this church. And because of that, I kind of saw what, I mean, God bless my parents, God, I mean, they're great. But at the same time, you know, there's a lot of culture that plays into it. And, um, you know, certain flaws in my parents' marriage and also certain flaws in the way we communicated at home, I saw kind of, um, uh, I saw what the baseline should be at church, like in terms of just how people really should express love, how people should communicate towards each other, things like that. That, um, and I, I feel like I'm just, like I'm so much better off than um, my two older my two older siblings who kind of didn't get as much of that. You know? But that's assuming that you are coming to church. Like that's oh, yeah. assuming you're, you're you know you have that opportunity, but there's a lot of people that don't. No, I mean that's also assuming that you you I mean the, I think the most important part is to actually realize all right this is dysfunctional in some sort of way, and because of that uh, I need to find out what is functional like. And I, that's basically when you asked, like, what's a distinguishing feature between that? Actually, knowing that this is dysfunctional, that mm -hmm. it's not. I think I think that's the hard part, though, because you think right, yeah. you think it's normal because yeah. you grow up. Okay. 
Yes, yeah, and so, and, and I, I don't want to complicate it too, too much. I was going to give an example about, well, let me not go there because it'll confuse you. But what I want to say is the distinguishing factor, and you touched on it very well, very nicely, Bishoy, is really um, I need to have, one, a level of awareness of what's what I see, two, an understanding, and then the th le awareness and understanding is where a lot of people stop. But the third step is personal growth. Take action towards personal growth. But what does that mean and what does it look like? You're absolutely right, Amir. It's very biblical, actually, because we need to seek truth, right? It's the same, ar we can actually transfer the same argument to say, what about all the Muslims in the world? What about all the Jewish people in the world? What about, what about, what about? But we know that the scripture is clear and says, if you seek me diligently with all your heart, you will find me. And we know that for those of us who are genuinely, because we all have a conscience, and those of us, even, even those who aren't baptized, have a conscience. And the Holy Spirit is we're at work. And, and I mean, let's just talk about ourselves. The Holy Spirit is ever more at work within us through baptism, right, and through confirmation. So when we are truly seeking truth, and if you remember the verse I put last time I was here was, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all other things will be added. If we are living a life that is truly seeking Righteousness and seeking to put God first, regardless of what my circumstances are, regardless of what my family looks like or where I come from or what I'm struggling with. If in my life and in my conscience I seek truth and I seek righteousness and I seek the will of God, then He will lead me. He will the Holy Spirit will naturally convict me towards personal growth. Will naturally convict me to say, I gotta do something about this anger. Will naturally convict me to say, I gotta do something about judging people all the time will naturally convict me of, of, of feeling like I need to do something about um, the fact that I'm afraid to get close to people. It, there, there's something so beautiful and so sensitive that can only come from the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And it can only come when we're in truth and when we're really seeking to be in the truth. So. I, I'm really glad you brought that point up because I really do think the distinguishing piece, it, it's, a, it's a critical one, and I, I agree too. It's so easy to fall back on, woe is me. Look at where I come from. You know, and, and, and it's, sort of a, it's sort of an unfair um, give, giving up or throwing in the towel because with the power and the grace of the Holy Spirit, again, that's why in talking about relationship, I have to look at myself first because then I can get into a relationship and then I can get upset with the way things are going, and then I can start pointing fingers and blaming. Blaming the past, blaming the person I'm with, because what? I didn't take the time to do the personal work to take responsibility for my own flaws. And we all have flaws. That was another thing I'm, that we'll get to, and I'll just say it now, is we all have flaws. <laughs> That's what I wanna say. <laughs> if you think you're gonna find the perfect person, you're not. And, and I, I mentioned my friend last time, and I'm gonna mention her again, because she really is so many ways perfect. In fact, she's too perfect. She's too in shape. She's too glamorized. She's too wealthy. She's too happy. You know, too much, too, too, too. And, and I think she, the, I, I really feel sad to say, I think she's looking for someone that she believes is as perfect as she is. And that's a problem. Because that person doesn't exist. Yeah. <coughs> I have a question. I don't know if it's going to be covered later on. Or, uh -huh. I mean, obviously, we all make mistakes as we grow older. But when you're looking for that person <coughs> to, with whom you're going to live for your whole life, um, how, like, how much do you look over? Like, how much of their mistakes do you, like, look over and ignore? Like, you know, because <coughs> you know that person did this mistake. Mm -hmm. you, you know, can you really let it go and live happily with this person? Right. I, I have an answer, or I have a response. We were going to get to it, but we can get to it now. I told you we didn't have to go like through this. Important. Are we talking about mistakes, events that are mistakes, or character? I'm talking more about character traits. I'm talking about character traits. So like, I use myself as an example. I think, I think last time I said I'm chronic. Sometimes you know I have an issue with being on time. For you, that might be something as Abuna and I like to call it, we have negotiables and we have non-negotiables, okay? So you have to determine, and what's negotiable for you might be different than someone, someone else. Um, 
But let, let, me, let me say that there are some things that are non-negotiable, right? And we could talk about what the, and the non-negotiables on some level should be the same for all of us. But then the negotiables might be different. You might be able to live with someone who's not on time, someone else might not. You might be able to live with someone who's a little bit disorganized, someone else may not, right? I think like, I might, like, just to help answer that, I think some things will directly result in a lot of fights. Like if you're stingy and I'm the kind that shops a lot, where it's not gonna work. <laughs> but if, if you're like, you know, if you're disorganized and I'm like a meat freak, you can compromise somewhat. But if like, it's something like, you know, being stingy or, you know, just. So it's basically personal. Yeah. These the things are personal. So what you can take, I might not take. What I can take, you might not take. Yeah. <laughs> you guys got that. There are three key words. Common interests, common goals, common values. Those are three areas that um, you need, you know, we, there, ha there have to be enough of a foundation that is non-negotiable when it comes to your interests. There have, honestly, me and Abuna are not interested in a lot of the same things at all. I'm really not into sports, and that is, a <coughs> excuse me, it is a big part of his life, but it used to be an even bigger part of his life. <coughs> Sorry. Um, <coughs> we actually don't share a lot of interest in a lot of things, to be quite honest. And some, the more, actually, as we've grown through our marriage, I realize how different we are and how our difference are really, our interests are really different. But we have enough similar similarity in our interests for us that we are, you know, are comfortable and accepting of the marriage. Where we, where it weighs heavy that we have a lot in common is our values and our goals. Now there's values, obviously, in terms of our Christianity, in terms of having, you know, um, how we want to raise families. Do we want to have a family? Wanting to have children or not, that's a huge, that's a huge decision and you can't really differ on that. Would you be willing to live in another country? When Abuna and I were getting to know each other, that we talked about that. What if God took us one day to another country? Would we be willing to go? Someone might have said, I will never, ever leave my family. And someone else might say, I will go wherever God takes us as long as we're together. That's a huge difference in a goal that you would share or not share. So while we don't have a lot of the common interests, we have a lot of similar goals and we have <coughs> a lot of uh, similar values. Yeah. So does one of the three components supersede others? Or are they all, they, should they all be? What do you think? Um, I mean, it seems to me that values are important and goals are important. But I, um, but I, yeah, I, I guess equally. Um, uh, so values, goals, and what? Interests. <coughs> if you take my example, just since I'm using myself as the, the guinea pig here, then I would also challenge and relating it to the topic and to this idea of meeting people and this idea of getting to, to be open to meeting different kinds of people. So what happens when you meet someone that doesn't have the same interests? A lot of times, what do we do? Check and we move on. But you have no idea when you get into a rich conversation with that person about the goals that they have for their life, how you may intersect. And I think what is not negotiable is the values. I mean, I think we need to say fundamentally, your values, your belief system is non-negotiable and that must take high priority because that directly goes back to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I am living a life in truth. I am living to work out my salvation <coughs> um, in my life, in my marriage, in my family. 
and that is not negotiable. Where you want to bend and have wiggle room, maybe two people have different goals, but they're willing and able to respect those goals and support one another. Two other people might have different goals and they just won't align. So it just depends what those goals are. For example, I, for, a lot, for most of our marriage, I've been in graduate school. That was a goal of mine. And I actually want to go back to school. That's a big decision. That makes me absent from the home for a lot of time. It's a very practical implication on my family. That's a goal that I have. Abuna wants to go back to school. He wants to get another degree. It's a goal that he has. <coughs> we have a common goal, but even if I, you know, he was a man who thought, you know, like, I really, you know, which would be legitimate, I really would prefer you not go back to school for your doctorate because at this point, Danny, halas, we have kids, that really needs to be our priority. That would be, you know, we would have to have a discussion, but that, those are two very different goals. It might not be a breaking point, obviously, but they, you could see how two different goals could still be um, honored and respected. Again, where we cannot negotiate is our values, our beliefs, our faith, our religion, um, and how we walk that out in our life. <clears throat> we covered... Um, okay. Hold on a second here. Okay, yeah. So, we're going to talk about... How much time we have? Okay, we only have a few more minutes. So, <coughs> we'll try to, to wrap up here. Um, I need to go back so that I can go forward. It's the same thing I've been saying bef as before. I just want you to take a, a minute, and I just brainstormed these words, so I'm sure there's many others I could have listed, but look up here and see if there's any particular term that uh, strikes you or describes you. The, let me just explain fear of intimacy um, or a fear of closeness might lead someone to be attracted to someone who's also you know, a bit disconnected because it's comfortable. So if for some reason I fear intimacy or getting too close with someone, <coughs> I might find myself constantly drawing myself close to people who are, you know, a bit disconnected emotionally, but I need to understand that. Um, that's why also for those of us who say there are no good guys out there, or there are no good, you know, girls out there, if, if there's a pattern where I'm get, I am open, I am meeting a lot of people, and I keep finding myself like no one's good enough, no one's good enough, I do have to take a moment and reflect and say, what might be at least a part of this that's going on within me that's contributing to this inability to me to find that match or to at least find someone who comes close to that match, okay? A fear of autonomy, what can that lead to? If I'm afraid of it, you know, being autonomous or independent, I might find myself repeatedly attracted to people who I can what? Exactly. And I know someone in my own life, a very, very close friend of mine who I love so dearly, she only dates guys who she can baby and nurture. Honestly, it's, and it's, it's, so, it's so sad. She spends money on them, she takes care of them, she cooks for them, she bails them out when they're in trouble, like to an extent where she, she needs them to feel dependent on her. And, and she needs to really take a minute and, and think about why is every single guy she's ever been with, and she's been with quite a few, has always been of that character. So you have to ask yourself, what role do I play in that, right? Um, fear of own sinful nature. I'm gonna explain this one, because I actually liked it. Um, in one of the books it was saying that, sometimes, you ever, you ever hear that, that um, quote about, like the good girls are attracted to the bad boys? Yeah. Well, so, some, and this is, this, is this is just a generalization, some people say that sometimes, what happens is when you find that good girl and she actually, oh, he wasn't when I met him. I wouldn't used to do that. <laughs> 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 I was trying to think, I'm like, no, not a bad boy, but you know, he, he was, you know, he was not like your straight edge, like deacon from the age of, you know, whatever. So, right. No. And I was kind of a good girl. Like I was always in the church and I was, you know, like I didn't really, I had my own sinful nature, obviously, but you know, there is something for good girls that <laughs> could be attractive about that. Well, what is it about? Some propose that, um, good girls or good boys or whichever you want to look at it, instead of looking at one, one's own sinful nature and one, one's own bad side, you, you draw upon it from others. So it's like all this stuff is happening and it's like, 
if we don't take the time to pause and think, it's like, well, why do I keep getting attracted to these bad boys? Well, there's a reason. You know, what am I trying to evade in my own life or look, or, or, or look for? Controlling, non-confrontational, passive, passive-aggressive, um, hostile, uncontrolled anger, insecure, guilt-ridden, always feeling guilty, holding grudges, sarcastic. That is a big one in our community. I find there are too many sarcastic people. <laughs> where does this, seriously, like, where does it come from? It, it, it's like disorganized. And then, you know, there's also positive things like confident, secure, independent, forgiving. I guess what I'm saying is consider how you would be describe your character and, and, and then think about, you know, what that means in terms of your um, quest for a relationship. There was a really cool example I want to share um, in one of the books. It was talking about this guy. I we'll call him John. And he kept getting attracted to, he kept going out with girls or meeting girls and, and, and going out with them who, liked, who wanted him more than he wanted them, right? And it, I think he had reached, he had passed like 35 and he was like, you know, he had been with so many girls and, you know, it talks about the, the person who writes the book was his, is actually, his, I think, his counselor. And he finally came to a point where he's like, something's got to be going on that I'm not picking up on because it's, I thought I would be married by now. And he, talk, he took a lot of time to, like, explore and be honest with himself. And he realized he was so afraid, he was so insecure and so afraid of rejection that he would always make sure he was with someone who wanted him more than he wanted them. But he noticed that his relationships were very short-lived. He didn't last with them very long because he, he got that thrill of, oh, she wants me, she wants me. And he would like go along for it for a while, but then it was like, ah, okay, move on. But there was no long-term relationships that, were, that, that lasted. And it was only when he, took, he did the work of really thinking about what was going on that he, he had this sort of realization of why it was that he wouldn't do the one, he wouldn't be the one chasing, but that why he always wanted to be chased. So again, sometimes like we can learn not just from our family of origin, but even in, if you've had, if you've had relationships or spent time getting to know people, like learn from those experiences as well. And it brings me to my last point, and I'll try to wrap up, and then if there's any questions, we can maybe take a minute. Um, we, I said this last time, and I have to say it again. None of this is really possible, and the Bible says very clearly in Proverbs, we need to surround ourselves with a multitude of counselors, godly counselors, godly friends, people who can speak the truth to us, and we're going to take it. Someone who, when they come to us and say, the way you've been dressing in church lately, I'm a little bit concerned people might get the wrong impression. And you can take it and not be defensive and not be upset and not be like, you know, I don't need this. I don't need this place. I don't need this church. You know, we, if we are not going to be honest to take a look and, and invite others that we trust who are godly to call us out, then we might be missing the boat on a lot of great opportunities because we're not really searching for the truth. We're just searching for what we want to hear. We just want a quick fix or a formula that gets us you know, to the place we want to go. So I really challenge each one of us to think about who's that, I would say at least two people, because you can never depend on just one. But at least two, if not three people in your life. It could be a parent, it could be a friend, it could be a relative, it, it could be whoever, but someone who you can really take as your accountability partner, who if you go to them, they'll tell you the truth. Why do you think no one wants to get to know me? Honestly, Laura, you, uh, you really need to take another look at uh, how, you talk to, how you talk to people or how you, you know, don't, don't give people your, the, the full attention when they're talking to you or whatever it is. You know, but we, we have to have that, that humility. And actually, that's, where's the slide? This is, this is a key slide right here. Going back to what we said earlier about what are the negotiables and the non-negotiables, a major, major non-negotiable is humility. Because if you're with someone, even if you don't have the same interests, and you, know, you have most of the same goals and you do have the same values, but they lack humility, that person will never be changed. Um, the reason I put the first verse up here, work out your own salvation in fear and trembling, is because I wanted to emphasize that you and I 
I know I'm starting to lose you guys, but I want to finish these last couple points. We are a work in progress. That's why when people ask us as Orthodox Christians, are you saved? Yes, I'm saved, and I'm being saved every day because it's a process and it's a work of the Holy Spirit. I wasn't served, saved in a day and I wasn't sa saved in a moment, but I'm being saved and I'm working out my salvation daily. Well, in the same way, if, I'm, if I recognize that I'm a work in progress, then I have to recognize all my brothers and sisters are a work in progress. And it, with that perspective and with that lens, then I can have the humility to accept that no one's perfect and that everyone has some work to do on themselves, including me. And I'm not going to, I'm going to be more understanding um, with that. But if, if someone doesn't have the humility, then I'm not going to change them. And they're never going to change. Because if someone doesn't have the humility to accept, they might need to renew their mind or not be conf conformed to certain patterns of the world, then they're never going to change. Because you, you can only influence others. You can only speak into the lives of others. You can never, ever change a person. Ever. Ever. Um, so I think... A key characteristic we need to look for in people is humility. Humility to look within themselves and humility to work on themselves. And with that, you can, you can really build a strong, uh, a strong relationship. <coughs> this is from last time, so I'm not going to take much time. It was just a reminder how to begin with yourself. Working on yourself and looking for relationship, begin working on myself. And again, the idea of having an alternative godly perspective means inviting people to speak truth into my life even when it hurts, or even when it's not what I want to hear. And then the last, I think this is my last slide, the present is a gift. I'm in my mid-30s, yeah, mid-30s. <laughs> um, officially mid-30s in two weeks. Um, but most of my friends are in their mid-30s. You know, so many of us, and even I am married, and even still, so many of us live in the future or we live in the past. And the purpose of what I share today is not to say, like, go back and, you know, fish out all the, you know, dirt from your past, and not to stay there, but to uh, bring it to awareness, understand it, and then identify what are the areas of personal growth and move forward to the present. Not to live in the future. One day when I get married, this is the dress I'm going to wear. One day when I get married, this is how many children I want to have. One day, it's good to dream, and it's good to have goals, and it's good to have aspirations, but you know what? And I did this a lot. We lose the present moment, and that's the gift that God has given us. And we waste it. Um, we waste it because we don't know how to just be still. Like it says, be still and know that I am God. It's hard. It's, it's really hard. Um, but I just invite each of us to, to live in the present. Um, And I'll just end with uh, the same verse we had last time, which is, again, to seek first the kingdom of God, and all things will be added. So, <coughs> uh, so any final thoughts or questions? Um,